our theme uh, for this week and next, because we're in the month of February, and next week is Valentine's Day, our theme is going to be on love. Now, how many here really would like to be loved? Nobody wants to be, oh, wait a second, let me ask you that again. How many here would really like to be loved? I'm going to tell you right now that you are loved. God loves you. So what I want you to do, turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you. All right. Now, what I want you to do is turn to the person and say, God really loves you. No, that wasn't good enough. So now you got to say, God really, really loves you. Turn to that person and say, God really, really, really loves you. All right. Ah, that's great. That's great. Now, in my Bible, which I have on the Lord's Supper table, six times in the New International Version, the expression, love of God, appears. Other translations have the expression more frequently, but in that translation, sometimes they just say, God's love rather than the love of God as a, a possessive sense. But I want to look at the six references to God's love as found in the New International Version. The first reference is to the fact that some people actually missed the love of God. Notice that it says at the bottom of this passage where Jesus is talking, I know that you have not the love of God. I call that, they missed it. They missed the love of God. How could you miss the love of God? Well, I want to suggest that they missed it by 12 inches. The distance between their head and their heart. The difference between the head and the heart. He says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think, it was in their head, that by them you possess eternal life. They knew about the love of God, but they missed it because it was not in their heart. It was not in their heart. He says, these scriptures, they testify about me, but yet you have refused to come to me to have life. Now the rest of the verse goes on to say, or the next verse, I do not accept praise from men, but I know you. Oh, Jesus says, I know you, and I know that you do not have the love of God in your heart. It was missing. It was gone. The head, but not the heart. When I share my faith one-on-one -on -one with people, I'll ask the question, have you come to the place in your life where you know for sure that if you died right now that you'd go to be with God forever? Simple question. Most people say, yes, I know. Some people say, I don't know. And when they say, I don't know, I say, well, then I don't know for sure means that you're not sure. Because the question is, are you sure? And I said, you know what the incredible thing is? The Bible is written that you might know for sure that you have eternal life. Not hope so, think so, wish so, but know so. They thought they had the truth. They had the Bible. They had the scriptures. They, had the, they could tell you. So I have to ask a follow-up question when I'm sharing my faith. I say, suppose you did die and you went to heaven and God met you at the gate and said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to God? And you know what most people say? I'd say 99% of the time, I'm a good person. My good outweighs my bad. They think that by being a good person, that's their ticket into heaven. But the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. None. There's none that do good, no, not so much as even one. Wow. And here the person's going to say, my good outweighs my bad. You see, they think, they think they have the love of God. But they've missed it by 12 inches. The passage says, you do not have the love of God in your heart. I always fear 
that people I know who have been churched a long time and they know the Bible stories. They can give you, they can tell you the Lord's Prayer, quote it perfectly. Yet, they don't believe in their heart, even the things that they are professing. Jesus is talking to them and saying, you say you believe the Bible, but the Bible all points to me, and you don't believe in me. You're so close, but so far away. So close, so far away. Jesus at one point said there are going to be people coming to him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Why? They knew in their head, but they didn't believe in their heart. Some people miss the love of God because they don't know him in their heart. From time to time, I meet Christians, professed Christians. And they say, well, you know, I don't need to go to church. I can worship anywhere. You know, is that true? Well, of course that is true. You, go to, you can worship anywhere. But I don't need to go to church. That part is not true. It's not. Jesus said, I will build my church. Jesus is active and involved in the church. And when you say, oh, I don't need to meet with people, obviously your heart hasn't been changed because you're not seeking the things that Jesus is seeking. Wow. It is true I can worship anywhere. But it is true also that God wants me to be in the church. In the church. Some people miss it by 12 inches. 12 inches. They just don't believe it in their heart. They don't practice it in their lives. But they know all about it. They know all about it. The second one is called the neglected love of God. This is found in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus says, whoa, you neglect the love of God. I got it highlighted there. You neglect the love of God. Now, he says, whoa, to you Pharisees. Now, these were the right-wing extremists. They kept all the letter of the law. They, they, they kept the scriptures, every little last detail. He says, and you give... God, a tenth. You're tithers. Somebody once said the last part of a person that gets saved is their pocketbook. It's the last place, the last thing they give to God. But they did this. They, they were giving their tithe, he says, of your mint and all other kinds of the garden herbs. Well, they weren't bringing just the coins. They were bringing on the productivity of everything they had. He said, woe to you Pharisees. You're following the letter of the law. And then he says, but you neglect the love of God. You neglect justice and the love of God. You're, you're not giving your heart to Christ. You live your life. You think, if just because I put my offering in the offering plate, or just because I attend the service, that covers it. No, God doesn't want your stuff. Of course, he commands you to give it to show what? Your love in your heart. But if you give it without having love in your heart, you might as well not give it. He knows it. It's got to be a heartfelt expression. For God says he loves a cheerful giver. He says you should have practiced the latter, giving me your heart, without leaving the former. It should be a wholehearted devotion to the Lord because of the love of God, the love of God. The third one I noticed in the third passage in the scripture that has this expression, the love of God, is found in Titus. In Titus chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is speaking. That's why I got a picture I usually use for the Apostle Paul up there. All right, he says, at one time we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Oh my goodness. This almost describes the times in which we live. Right now, you can't express a different opinion to someone without them blacklisting, censoring, or cutting you out, cutting you off. We are in a hate-filled world that will not tolerate anything that the other person says or does without responding with hateful speech. Ought not to be so among Christians. I don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, an Independent, a Communist, a Socialist, an extreme right-winger. 
So one time, you were like those people, so filled with hate. But he said, but when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. He saved us. Oh, him writer said, I was sinking deep with it in sin, far from the peaceful shore. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. You see, Jesus is the lifesaver. He appeared in time and history in order to go to the cross and die on the cross to take our place to rescue us. And all who reach out and grab the life ring of Jesus and accept Jesus as their Savior, he saves them because the love of God has appeared in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, not only does he save us, it says he does so by his mercy. Uh, two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and he beat his breast. And he said, oh, God, I thank you that I'm not like this publican, this tax collector, this sinner. And the tax collector, the publican, the sinner he beat his breast and said, Oh God, have mercy to be a sinner. Be propitious to me. A sinner is the Greek text. The propitiation was like, a, and the Ark of the Covenant had a lid on it. And the lid is where they would sprinkle the blood. And the blood would be sprinkled to cover your sins so that you would not die for your sins, but the blood covered it. And what he was saying is, Lord, be propitious. Lord, be merciful. Cover my evil with your good. He beat his breast and said, Lord, be propitious to me, a sinner. And Jesus asked the question, which man went away justified? And the answer is very simple. The man who begged for mercy, not the arrogant and proud, displaying all of his self-righteousness. The love of God appeared to save us, to mercy us, and to wash a rebirth and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now this picture here is a guy by the name of Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus by night and said, hey, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God because nobody can do the miracles you're doing except God is with them. And Jesus just looked at him and said, you must be born again. You know, sometimes you just cut to the chase. Now, when he worked with the woman at the well, he built up to the case. You know, he talked to her and had conversation and finally lowered the boom on her uh, about the gospel. Not this case. You must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? And Jesus said, except a man is born of water and born of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again, Nicodemus. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it's going next. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Then he tells them a story. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. When they lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, because the people had sinned, and the sin was complaining. You ever complained? Ooh. The sin of complaining, God sent fiery serpents. These fiery serpents were biting the people, and they were dying. That's called judgment. The people came to Moses and said, Moses, pray for us. And Moses prayed, and God said, make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, lift it up, Everyone that looks to the serpent, they will be saved from the snake bites, from the judgment. Those that didn't look, they perished. He says, even as Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him, when they look in faith, they believe. When they believe in Jesus, they're looking to Jesus. He's saying, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For God so loved the world, there it is, the love of God, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. Nicodemus, you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are regenerated. You are born again. You are born from the inside out. 
He changes you and gives you eternal life. The fourth reference that I found in the scripture is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. It's the very last verse of the Corinthians. It says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We've got the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all in one verse here, and it's an invocation, a prayer, that may the love of God be with you. I often end that conversation, telephone call, with, hey, God bless you. God bless you. And people will say to me, he already has. And they say, praise the Lord, but may he bless you even more. I mean, we go on back and forth all day like this, okay? May the love of God be with you. Of course it's with me. I'm a Christian. I accepted Christ at eight years old. I got baptized at 12. I entered into the ministry. I've been preaching the gospel all my life, ever since 16 years old when I preached my first sermon at Detroit City Rescue Mission. God has been with me. So what's he mean? May the love of God be with you. I'm thinking he's saying, may the love of God that is poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit ooze out of you so that other people see the love of God that's with you. May the love of God be with you. May the Holy Spirit manifest it because Jesus Christ has graced you to give you the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. He's invoking that. He's, he's imploring that. Let the love of God shine through you. The fifth of the six that are found in my New International Standard Bible is called the inseparable love of God. No, I think it has other thing. I dropped that. No, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing. For I am convinced, he says, neither death nor life. Death can't separate you. Life can't separate you. Well, I think what he's saying here, listen. In the book of Romans, later, he's going to say this. In the 14th chapter. For none of us lives to himself alone. And none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we are alive, we live, or death, we die, we belong to the Lord. When a person dies who knows Jesus, God still loves them. God takes them to heaven. They're with God. Death cannot separate you from God's love, nor life, nobody in life. No one can take the love of God from you in life. It's one thing that you've got, nobody can take. My mother used to tell me, Dennis, they can take a lot of things away from you. They could take your car, they could take your house. They can take your friends. They could take your life. But they can never take your education. You can never take your education. That's the most valuable thing, besides knowing the Lord, that you've got is your education, because nobody can take that away from you, what you know. They can lock you up and, listen, death can't take the love of God from you. No one in life can take the love of God from you. You are loved by God if you know Jesus Christ. He said, neither angels nor demons. There are no good guys, good angels, that will say, you're so bad, God doesn't love you. There are no demons, they're so terrible, who's going to say, you're too wicked for God to love you. No one can stop God from loving you. This is awesome. This is great. He says, neither thing's present. So I got today's calendar. Today is February 7th. 2021. Nothing today can take God's love away from you. Watch this. Nor the future. I jump down to Christmas. Nothing between now and then, or even beyond then, nothing in the future can stop God from loving you. Now we need to just stop and say, thank God he loves me. Let's do that right now. 
Thank God you love me. I didn't hear it. Thank God you love me. Whoa. Nothing. What? what? Nor any powers. Now, I couldn't think of anything more powerful than an atomic or nuclear explosion, which decimate me, melt me down, solidify, you know, vaporize me. Nothing. No destructive power. No power can separate me from the love of God. Jesus said, God has us in Jesus' hand. And then God has Jesus in his hand. I am doubly secure in the love of God. God really loves me. Watch it. Neither height nor depth. You can be on, on, on the top of the cliff. I was about... I don't know, maybe eight years old, when my older brother Eddie and I were standing at the edge of the Niagara Falls. Anybody ever been there, Niagara Falls? On the Canadian side, where you can get right up to the edge, and you can look right over. I'm on that rail, leaning over, and my brother sneaks up behind me, grabs me, and lifts me, and pulls me back down, just like that, and said, oh, I saved you. Of course, he started running because I was swinging. What you just about gave me, an eight-year-old kid, a heart attack. Listen, to be right there at the edge, the precipice, no height, so great, you can't fall over that the hand of God does not catch you. He loves me. He loves me. No height, no depth, it doesn't matter. It is inseparable. Nor anything else in all of creation. I don't know. Every now and then, you know, reading the, you know, a science report that some comet is coming towards Earth, but it's going to miss us by, you know, five, six hundred thousand miles, which is a close call. And people are all worried. It's going to be the end of the world. No, God loves me. God loves me. I, you know, we're living in distressing times. COVID and all the mess. You know, God loves you. Nothing in all this creation can separate you from the love of God. That's what he says. Nothing in all this creation separates us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whoa. There's a little song that I learned as a child and every now and then. When nobody's around, they'll sing it because everybody knows it's a child song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. God loves me. God loves me. Here's the sixth one. The sixth one, he says, how can the love of God be in him? Ooh, that's a question. I call this the questionable love of God. He says, how can you know that it's really in you? First of all, you've got to ask yourself, what is love? And he answered it in this verse. This is how we know what, what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Folks, this is the greatest, this is the greatest depiction of life, love in history. It says in Romans 5, verse 8, God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Literally, for us means he took our place. He was our substitute. The nail pounded in his hand should have been mine, but he took my place. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, not when we were good and, wow, you're getting a prize here, but while we were yet sinners, worthy of hell, damnation, eternal separation from the love of God, he loved us anyway. He says this, this is what is love? So what should we do in light of such love? Oh, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Whoa. There should be no hostility between a Democrat and a Republican, a Republican and a Democrat, anything. A freedom lover, the communist. In the body of Christ, when you are a brother, you should be willing to lay down your life for that other brother. That's what he says. 
Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Whoa. These are powerful, powerful, powerful. So how does this kind of love show up? If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, whoa. How does it show up? When you see someone in need, you help them. You help them. In our bulletin today, there was a helping hands, the fun card again. And there's a reason why it's been in there a little more often. It's because we've been using it. We pretty near depleted it, even after a good offering the last time. Because there are brothers, people in need, and we reach out and help them. And so I encourage you again today, put something extra in there for those who are in need. Because this week, someone else may be in need and we might need to reach out to them. But I don't think it's just the helping hands fund. It's when we see someone in need. There used to be a gentleman who sat outside the grocery store, and then they didn't want him there anymore, so he's down at the pharmacy, and then they didn't want him there. And he was a, he'd moved to different stores, and he was a burn victim. He had no fingers, and he was pretty, pretty marred. And I hate to tell you the story because I lose my reward. You're supposed to do this in secret. <laughs> but my heart would be touched every time. And I'd reach in my wallet, and sometimes I just, it got empty because I always knew I could go through the drive through and get more out of the bank. But I put it in the man's can. He tried to offer me a little token, you know, but I didn't want it to be works. I wanted it to be grace. And I'd say, no, you, you, you can keep it. And I'd stop and talk to him. He was a Tigers fan. We talked baseball. And, but, but he had to be, be dropped off there and, and picked up later. But if your heart is not touched by human misery, you have no idea of the love of God is what he's saying. Because God's heart was touched by your human misery being in your sin, not living for him. And he sent Christ to die for you. He loves you. And he wants you to love him with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. He asked this question then, how can the love of God be in him if his heart is not moved with passion, compassion for those who are in need? When you have so much, and we established that because all of, the, all, all of the Open Door Salvation Army, all of those that are taking in our old stuff, they're overrun with it because during COVID, we all cleaned our houses and we all took it there. And they said, we can't handle it. We, got to, we don't have any storage space for it anymore. We all have excess from which we can open our eyes and see people and let the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, spill out to someone else. He said, if that doesn't happen, you've got to ask yourself, how can the love of God be in me? Because he works from the inside out. Wow. I want you to think about the love of God from these texts today. Some people have missed it all together. It's all in their head. Their faith is all a head knowledge, no heartfelt. Some have neglected half-heartedly. They do half the cause but not all that God wants them to do. Some have accepted its appearance and salvation, and, and there's really been a work inside the heart that is working and flowing and coming out. Some have even invoked it, and, and, and they're sharing it. They're spreading it. They're telling it. They're, they're invoking God's love to be in other people. Some realize I am inseparably linked to the love of God. He loves me no matter what. He loves me no matter what. And then there are some who show what it is. I think these are an awesome six. Six places in the Bible that talk about the love of God. Finally, I'm going to leave you with this. I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of these, the least of these, my brethren... You did for me. We all know that verse. But it's so important. We have got to share 
the love of God that's within our hearts. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're very thankful that you love us. Our, our love is so imperfect, Lord. It is so flawed. Yours is so perfect. We thank you that you loved us, that you saved us, you've mercied us, you've rebirthed us, you've done so much for us. Help us, Lord, to allow that love to fill our hearts and spill out of us. That we will touch other people's lives and they, they will say, I want what you have. I, I want the love of God like you've got it. We know, Lord, the Bible says we're so, supposed to so live that people are provoked to ask us the reason of hope. Our hope is in the love of God. Help us, Lord, this week to open our eyes to those who are in need because you have saved us. Lord, I fear that perhaps today there's someone who's hearing my voice who has missed the love of God by 12 inches. They professed it with their mouth, but have failed to believe it deep in their heart. I pray that right now they'd call out and say, Lord, forgive me. I give you my heart. Truly, Lord, save me. Not just my head, but all of me in my heart. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.